Chat Night Africa Live, about to begin. Chat Night Africa Live, Afrocentric solutions to Africa's challenges. Showcasing Africa's touristic luxurious. The other story of Africa. Chat Night Africa Live, about to begin. Chat Night Africa Live, about to begin. Chat Night Africa, let's gang up, change mindsets, and empower Africans. Are you ready? Africa to the world! And now, Chat Night Africa Live, with Divine Chamoko. <laughs> Hello, everyone. Welcome to this edition of uh, Chat Night Africa. It is usually said that ignorance of the law is no excuse. Simply put, you don't find yourself on the wrong side of the law and before a judge, you say, well, oops, you didn't know. Well, you'll be um, taken away in handcuffs into a jail. Now, because ignorance of the law is no excuse today at Chat Night Africa, you and the law. We have two lawyers. Barrister Edwin Fogham will be talking on family law and uh, Barrister Fatma Tabari will be taking questions on, so, uh, on sexual harassment. We also have somebody who will be talking from the sociological perspectives. To all these topics we are announcing. Ladies and gentlemen, you will find this broadcast an exceedingly exhilarating one. By the time the broadcast is over, I guarantee this, you will think and talk like a lawyer. Ladies and gentlemen, join me in welcoming Fatmata Bari on the platform. This is Fatmata. Hello, Fatmata. Um, you were muted. Okay, that's fine. Hello, Fatmata. You're fine. I'm, how are you? I'm fine. Thank you for accepting the invitation to come on Chat Night Africa. Ladies and gentlemen, I told you we don't have just a lawyer here today. What happens when two lawyers cross paths? on a broadcast platform. Well, find that out for yourself. Join me now in welcoming lawyer Edwin Fogham on the platform. Here is lawyer Edwin Fogham. Hello, lawyer Edwin Fogham. Hello, Divine. You're going to have to shift to the right a little bit. Okay, I think Very so. good. We're going to have uh, an exciting broadcast. First of all, can a wife sue her husband for rape? Don't answer now. We have this and many more. It's not only lawyer Fogham and attorney Fatma Tabari who will be on the platform. We have Dr. Patience Fielding. Dr. Patience Fielding now appears on the platform. Hello, Dr. Patience Fielding. Thank you for coming on Chat Night Africa, Voices of Africa, Chat Night Africa. Hello, thank you for having me. We will have an exciting broadcast today. Ladies, and gentlemen, serious things are about to begin. Lawyer Edwin, I have a first question for you. Marriage is said to be a covenant, not a contract. So therefore, make the case why people who came together in love should put aside other things to listen to you, talk to them on family law. Yeah, thank you divine and 
thank you everybody for the opportunity to present this. Um, as you rightly say, familiar relationships based on love, trust, and care are usually considered to be sacred. Now, it is therefore strange that sometimes we have we attribute contractual issues to, to those relationships. However, you have to understand that uh, while these relationships are sacred, sometimes bad things happen. Expectations are not met, situations change, uh, interest and values change. And because of those th changes, the law sometimes views this relationship in a contractual sense. Uh, again, you have to understand that even if you come together or family relationships are based on trust and good faith, it is very important to inform and instruct yourself about the legal underpinnings and ramifications of what could go wrong. Therefore, I suggest to you and anybody who is watching and who would like to ask questions that it is necessary to be informed in these matters. Thank you, and we'll be uh, delving into the nooks and crannies of all the statements he has just made. Ladies and gentlemen, I am bringing up lawyer Fatmata Bari to take the first question. Fatmata, why should people leave all they have to do? People are busy now. Why should they leave all they have to do to listen to you, to watch you talk to them on sexual harassment? What is the scope of the problem? Well, simply put, um, can you hear me well? Yes, please. So simply put, if you care enough about your work environment, if you care enough about how you treat people at work, if you care enough about making sure that you do not put yourself in a situation or position where you are making someone uncomfortable, where you are violating someone's rights, someone's space, then I think you should listen. If you um, want to go to work and feel comfortable and know what rights you have as a worker, you should stay on and listen. If you want to make sure that you it, don't get fired or don't get go to jail or as an employer not be sued i would suggest you stay and listen so basically that's why you should stay and listen this is chat night africa my name is uh, divine chamukong i am anchoring this broadcast from washington dc metropolitan area ladies and gentlemen join me now in welcoming dr patience fielding as i said earlier on she will be taking the issues from sociological perspectives. Dr. Fielding, speak to me. You are working for me at Chat Night Africa as one of my employees. Let's take that scenario. And I ask you out. I want to date you. I ask if I can date you. As a woman, do you feel sexual harassment if I ask to date you as your boss at Chat Night Africa? I think one of the things we have to look at are the power dynamics in the workplace. And when we talk about sexual harassment, it has been a case where it's consensual. When it's not con when it's not consensual, it's harassment. Also, we cannot look at the context without looking at the power and how that influences people. And so if you have a boss who's asking an employee out, that or you see the power hierarchies, and that puts the, the female in a compromising situation because first of all, that's her boss. Her livelihood depends on that job. Her performance depends on the board and on the review. And so her not say, saying yes might compromise her job and her saying yes might force into situation. So that's what we mean about, what we talk about sexual harassment where it has to be who is the power, uh, who has most power in that space and how are they using it? Are they abusing it? Or are they facilitating? See, because the boss's job is not to carry sexual favors. The boss's job is not to date employees, it's to support employees and provide them safe and nurturing spaces. But, but then when you start mixing 
a dating scenario, then it really compromises. And at the end of the day, it compromises the situation of the subordinate because they don't have much choice in terms of what to say, because either way, the, the situation is not working out for them. Thank you, Dr. Fielding. We'll be bringing you back to the platform. Let me, at this point, have Fatmata Bari take some questions on sexual harassment. Lawyer Barry, what do you define, and we're talking about a legal definition of sexual harassment? Well, sexual harassment basically is any touching, any inappropriate conversations um, can lead to sexual harassment. So it's basically a situation where um, if a person feels that the um, either the boss, and it doesn't always have to be the boss, it could be a colleague, um, making sexual innuendos or requiring sexual favors for a job well done um, award for you to keep your job or keep your position or um, be promoted or um, someone exposing themselves to another someone touching um, a person in, inappropriately, or if the person that's receiving the touch feels that's inappropriate and they have informed that individual that it's inappropriate, but the person continues sexual harassment. Um, those sort of things um, will be considered as sexual harassment, especially if, if it's a basis um, or if your positive response is a basis for your employment or for pay raise or any of those um, those things. So that's sort of the definition. We can get into later what, um, how you can prove it in, in court. I, so, I was going to, I, I was going to say that, but before we get to those angles, um, Lawyer Barry, how is sexual harassment different from sexual assault? Well, Sexual assault is the actual act of physically, physically um, touching someone and sexually um, having a sexual relationship with them against their will. That is a physical act that results in uh, um, um, sexual intercourse. That is sexual assault. And sexual intercourse in, in any form whether it is um, using an object on the individual, whether it's uh, um, man to man, man to woman, woman to woman, it's still sexual assault. So therefore that's what sexual assault is because it's a physical actual act. Um, and before I go further, just to be clear, um, anything I speak here is not me providing legal advice to anyone per se, because this is a, um, a confident um, informational um, talk and providing um, education, hopefully, to, to the audience. And it does not create an attorney-client relationship with anyone who may be listening, just, to be, just so I can put that disclaimer in there. Thank you. Thanks uh, for those um, definitions. If keep three women. Divine tells one, you look cute. That's woman A. Woman B, Divine tells her, you look sexy. Mm -hmm. The third woman, woman C, Divine tells her, you look hot. Would you say any of these statements amount to sexual harassment? Okay, so I think this is where many times people um, would say, well, all I did was tell her she looked beautiful or she looked gorgeous. If you're in a workplace and you're a man, that's a woman, and you are the boss, my advice, don't do it. So yes, when you go to court, there's, you know, there are standards that you have to meet to prove sexual harassment. So generally speaking, um, different states sort of have their own different rules or um, bar on how you prove it. Here where I live in Montgomery County, we recently 
changed it where it no longer has to be what's called severe and pervasive, which means it does not necessarily have to be so bad that you can't take it because that makes it very difficult for the victim to come forward or to prove anything or to even for anyone to listen to them. But um, there are many areas, there are many places who, who still require it to be severe and pervasive, meaning that just what it says, it has to be severe and pervasive, meaning it has to be happening so badly, so, so much and so long before you can have um, uh, a leg to stand on as the victim. But any of those three things, I think almost anyone would say they're not quite appropriate for workspace. If you're talking about a workspace, especially if you're talking about um, an employer and an employee sort of um, situation. So, yes. Um, I just got a text and um, somebody says, lawyer Barry, um, I'm afraid I'm reading the text. If that's what it amounts to, I'm afraid many women may go without husbands um, since you just may be worried what a woman at your workplace you fall in love with, you have a crush on, is going to interpret your statements to her. How do you react to that person? Very simple. If you're an employer, again, I said it earlier. So people meet at work, they develop relationships, they develop friendships. But I think we all know when things are not that. And, uh, and I think to a certain degree, we, we tell ourselves that it's not that bad. But if you ask a woman out one time, she said no. And she basically has laid it down. I'm not interested in you whatsoever. And you keep pushing. That's, that could elevate to harassment, especially if she, as the recipient, has been very clear that she does not want a relationship. And I think it's it, it's um, to say that women will not get married, of course they will. You know, I did not meet my, my boyfriend at work. People meet other people outside of work all the time. And I think it's very easy. If you see someone you like at work, wait after work, especially if your colleagues and say, can I take you to dinner? If she really is interested, she will say, yes, please. I would love to have dinner with you. If she's not interested, she will tell you she's not interested. And when she tells you she's not interested, believe her. You say wait after work. So is the problem the location where the, advance, uh, the advances are made or the fact that they're even said? If, if you're my colleague at work and I'm saying this to you at the restaurant, I took you there after work, would you still claim sexual harassment well if if you took her to the restaurant i mean she consented to go to dinner with you so that's obviously not sexual harassment because you asked her out and she said yes she wanted to and she went to dinner with you however if she has been very clear the first time you asked her maybe even the second time and she said i'm not interested but you do not stop you walk up to her at work you lean on her you lean over her you stand close to her, even though you know she's fully uncomfortable, that's sexual harassment. If, as the boss, you see your um, subordinate outside of work and you're bothering her outside of work about having some sort of sexual relationship, that's still sexual harassment. Because the reality is there's a hierarchy, right? She's the subordinate, you're the boss, and what you say to her, regardless of where you are, matters, and it can make an impact. So you have to think about that. Lawyer Fatma Tabari. <clears throat> Tell me, what happens that decades after women show up, and I'm going to ask Dr. Fielding that question, women show up and it's beginning to seem in the court of public opinion that the man is guilty. The question I'm going to ask you as a lawyer is, in common law system, the presumption of, there's a presumption of innocence until proven guilty. 
But what we see is the man is almost guilty. The moment you have a bunch of women who show up and said, and say, this guy harassed me, maybe 25 years after. What's your reaction to that as a lawyer? Well, this is the thing. In law, you go by evidence, right? So if you have a stack of provable evidence, you sort of already formed your opinion as you're going into your case because there's, there's an abundance amount of evidence. So when you see a lot of women coming out, especially women who may not have any relationship whatsoever, don't know each other, have never met each other, and they're all saying the same thing, it gives, it gives a, 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 a notion of, oh, they, they may actually be telling the truth. So there is an element of that. However, as an attorney, I always hold judgment until there's evidence presented. And once the evidence is presented, then I can come to my own conclusion. But again, what you see the most of is how much of that is put out there, how many women come forward, how many women who come forward are telling the same story, how many women who come forward have no connection whatsoever except for this one individual. And they all seem to know something that's similar about this one individual. And that's 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 a that's part of why the public forms this opinion, because that's what we do as human beings. If everything seems to point to something, we say oh, that must be it. But again, the now, how do you tell me a little bit fat matter, how did the judges handle this just because what 10 women came up showing this saying the same thing that becomes evidence well think about it so if a crime is committed and you have ten people who say i saw him shoot that man you have 10 corroborating witnesses saying the same thing they did not collaborate they did not meet and say we're going to say the same thing but they all say the same thing chances are you will believe, and the court or jury will believe 10 people coming out to say the same thing about the same incident. It's the same process. If 10 women get on the stand and testify and say the same thing about the same individual, and there's nothing to counter that, you have corroborating witnesses or corroborating statements, corroborating um, testimonies, and at the end of the day, that's what counts, and that's what evidence is. Evidence is putting together things that make sense, and they all cooperate, and there's nothing that um, counter the, that evidence. So that's what that's what happens. You are watching Chat Night Africa. You and the law, and as I said at the very beginning. Ignorance of the law is no excuse. So you better pay attention to the content of this broadcast. At some point, we will be taking calls. 240-603-7367. Welcome, Dr. Patience Fielding on the platform. Hello, hello. Dr. Fielding, lately there have been a lot of accusations by women accusing men of sexual harassment. As a woman, when you watch that avalanche of accusations, what comes to you? What, what comes to your mind? Um, well, first of all, it, goes, it all goes back to the evidence, what evidence they have, because it's one thing to accuse somebody of sexual harassment. It's another thing of actually having sexual harassment occur. And what we've seen with these high profile cases, and I'll, go, I'll give some examples, for example, <clears throat> Harvey Weinstein, Jeffrey Epstein, we had, they had evidence. Uh, and so evidence from, and just like uh, lawyer Barry mentioned. You want to shift to the right um, place. When you have several women come in and the only common denominator is that person, then it's, 
it's worth looking into that case. Hello, patients. What, you what want to move a little bit to the right? You want to move a little bit to oh, the right? Oh, can you see okay, me? Oh, beautiful. Sure. Okay. Just a little bit to the right again. Yeah, okay. when you see when you see so many cases, you want to ask what the evidence is. What the evidence? Because anybody can say anything, but the, in, in the law, the only thing that is upheld is the evidence. But what we've seen, especially in these high-profile cases, which always gets convicted, I'm going to talk about the Harvey Weinstein case or the Bill Cosby case. We have to understand when the women, and it's, it also it's also interesting because this were, these cases occurred in the film industry, and these people were powerful women in that space who control that space, who provided access to those women to opportunities, or who gave them opportunities because they gave the, in exchange for sexual favors. So again, it comes down to the evidence because these high profile cases, there's always a, a, a bevy of women saying the same thing and going to the court, court of law, which was which was upheld in, in the two cases. But I want to make another point in, in, in terms of context, when you mention because oftentimes, and especially I'm going to talk from Africans, from the African perspective, because we, we tend to uh, sexual harassment, we don't quite understand where the boundaries are. In Africa, for example, uh, the, the context of chasing a woman, women have to be coy. You know, you have to ask five, six times. They start by saying no, and then you pursue, and then you pursue, and you pursue. But meanwhile, within the United States, for example, no is no. And so sometimes when we come into a new space, we have to understand what the rules of engagement are. At our job sites, we have a sexual harassment policy, which clearly outlines what is harassment and how the how you conduct yourself while at work. So it, it's, it's great to get to know these new um, places in which we operate uh, so that we know how to engage, we know how to engage with our colleagues, and we also know how to protect ourselves and make sure we, we, we keep those boundaries whilst at work. Some women likely would, would enjoy being told that, you know, the dress, the tight-fitting pants, trousers we call in Europe and Africa, they're wearing, kind of they look great, they look hot in it. So the question I'm asking you is, don't you find situations that this is subjective, the interpretation is how people just feel about it. There's no clear, there are no clear metrics to measure that this squarely fits that definition of sexual harassment. I'm not even talking about sexual assault in this case. Absolutely, but again, it goes back to what Dr. Uh, 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 Lawyer Barry was saying. It is the workspace, there's a time and place for compliments. If you have, for example, saying somebody is hot or you're sexy. I mean, I don't, I don't know situations where people wear tight fitting dresses to, to, to work. We are dressed professional, women dress professional. If they look good, they look good. But constant, there's, there's, a, there's a difference between a barrage of requests and, 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 and comments and just saying, oh, you look good. By the way, your skirt looks good or your hair. There's nothing wrong with compliments, but it's a line to draw between uh, compliment and sexual harassment, where you're constantly giving unwanted advances, um, giving comments that violate somebody's space. We have to always remember this is a professional space. We are at work. And if we remember that what we're there for, then it will help us to, to create those boundaries and to use language that is appropriate. This is Chat Night Africa, and the subject today on the show is sexual harassment. Lawyer Edwin Fogham will come back on to speak on family law. Back on the platform is lawyer Fatmata Barry. Where do you draw the line between compliments and harassment? Well, I think I sort of um, intimated that earlier. Um, putting pressure on someone, um, constantly asking for either sexual favors or making the workplace uncomfortable for an individual. Um, and it can be a man to a woman, a woman to a man. And I think we focus a lot on men to women, but you have female bosses also. And it could be the other way around. Um, and, and I've heard jokes that guys make, oh, if my boss wants my body, there are many men who don't want that. So it's, and making jokes, making sexual innuendos, making um, those sort of things are, can be very uncomfortable for women, for many women. And so 
speaking as a woman as, and as an attorney, you have to consider that fact. So if the if if you're not a friend of mine once said, if it's something you're not going to say to your male colleague, don't say it to your female colleague. If you think it's inappropriate for your male colleague, don't say it to a female colleague. So if you're not gonna look at your male colleague and say you are hot, don't look at your female colleague and tell her <laughs> she is hot. You know, so this, the respect that you have for your male colleague, have it for your female colleague. And even if she has on a tight skirt, even if she has on a tight dress, that's because she likes it. Not because she's looking for a man to touch her inappropriately, not because she's looking for a man to make inappropriate comments about her sexuality. It is her body. She can do with it as she pleases. She can wear what she wants on her body. You treat her the same way you would want someone to treat your mother, your sister, or any female family member that you have. If you will not like it, if your sister comes and says, this guy at work did A, B, C, D, then don't do it to somebody else's sister, mother, auntie, uncle, whatever. So Fatima, that, I, I, I'm so delighted to have you on the platform. First of all, because you are you, you have African descent. And I, you am, I was born in Africa, just so absolutely. You know. And you practice law in the United States. Are there times when culture comes into play when interpreting sexual harassment? If I'm not mistaken. You are from Sierra Leone, am I right? Correct. Would you say the same thing in Sierra Leone? Yes. How wouldn't you take into, con into context the culture of the people of Sierra Leone? The reason I ask you this question is I didn't go to law school, but I think that a body of laws are formulated taking into account the cultures, the values of the people, their social habits. So that's why I ask you, would you say the same thing in Sierra Leone? Would sexual harassment mean the same thing in Sierra Leone as it does in the United States? I would say yes, and I'll say it this way. So I would say it's the same thing, but I will explain it in context of the traditions because it's not always culture, right? Culture is usually a beautiful thing. It's something that is carried on from generation to generation it's within the fabric of that people. A lot of what we talk about is traditional, things that people have just done traditionally and have continued doing. So within the tradition of that community, I will explain what harassment and sexual harassment means because it's no, a woman's feeling of being harassed does not change just because of the location she's in. It's the same way as we, we, we make comparisons to um, the culture, that our African culture. We have older men who marry 15-year-old girls or 14-year-old girls or, you know, and, but that is changing, right? Because people are realizing and admitting there's something wrong with that because I've spoken to women who are now adult, my age, who were married off at the age of 13, 14. And the stories they tell me of how they felt when they get when they got in bed with that old man, older man, even if he's not old, but older man, was it was excruciating. Like I felt their pain. And that doesn't change just because it's happening in Africa as opposed to in the West. So that same explanation needs to be made in the context of where we are as a continent, as a country, in my case, in Sierra Leone, because it's still inappropriate. You're still making somebody uncomfortable at work. You're still forcing someone to accept your sexual advances because she wants to keep her job, as opposed to if she didn't, she would tell you where to go, but she can't. That doesn't change. It's still sexual harassment when asked the question the governor of new york said mr cuomo said well he didn't touch the women but he made them uncomfortable what's the difference 
he didn't touch them, so he didn't um, uh, he didn't assault them. Yeah. Okay. However, if he spent a lot of time over, especially over a long period of time, making these women very uncomfortable in the workplace sexually, that's sexual harassment. The question that I, I, I we discuss this a lot because it's very much in, in the news. And the question many people are asking is, how come these ladies sit there? I mean, they didn't tie them up. They they were not they, they were not being harassed at gunpoint. You sit there and listen to all the statements, then you go out and cry foul. I mean, how do you react to that as a lawyer? So I'm sure everyone who is watching at some point, maybe not everyone, but many at some point, have been in jobs that you did not like. You did not like your boss yelling at you. You did not like that your boss is calling you on a Sunday, even though you're off. You did not like that your boss says that at, it's seven o'clock, but he or she still wants you to be there working. Why would you do that? Why would you stay, even though you don't like it? Same reason, you want to keep your job. I, I'm not sure why we keep using that analogy when it comes to women complaining of being sexually harassed or sexually assaulted. Every, almost everyone who has been an employee has had to, at some point, accepted what their boss requires of them, even if they don't like it, until they find another avenue out. It's the same concept. Don't blame the woman for trying to make a living and trying to live the best life that she could. And, and at some point, in some part of her mind, hoping and praying it would change because she really enjoys this kind of work, but she just doesn't like who her boss is. Are you concerned that these women are showing up 25 years after, some 10 years after, five years after? Somebody must be asking the question, but you were harassed. Why didn't you raise a complaint at that time? there is such a thing as called power structure, right? Power structure. So if I come up and I say, this man who is a billionaire made a pass at me and he sexually harassed me and I am nothing more than an assistant, what are the chances that I will be, I will be believed, but this person will not be? There's such a thing as feeling comfortable within the numbers. So if one, two, three people come out, if it takes one brave woman and it's, and it's very brave because when these things happen, majority of the time, the first instinct of people is, like you said, why did she wait so long? Or why did she stay there? They're not asking, why did he do that? Why didn't you stop yourself, uh, Mr. Man, whoever you are? Instead, the question is always asked of her. And that is why many women don't come forward. There's a safety, a feeling of safety when there's several of you because you have somebody else to lean on and you don't feel alone and you feel there's somebody else who has experienced what you have experienced and they understand and you feel, well, they should believe all of us now by myself. They may not believe me. That's why. So when you have one person comes out because it just happened to them, and we're in, a, we're in the environment where women are feeling more empowered than ever before. And so people, women are standing up more for things. So then you have people coming from before who said, oh my goodness, I, can, I feel safe now. That's why. This is Chat Night Africa. And wherever you are, let me, let, you, let me inform you about this. You don't have to be on Facebook to watch this broadcast right now. My social media platforms manager, Zet Roger, who is uh, producing this broadcast in Lagos, Nigeria, is streaming the show on www.chatnightafrica.net. www.chatnightafrica.net. Ladies and gentlemen, we'll be right back.
Chat Mad Africa, let's gang up, change mindsets, and empower Africans. Are you ready? Africa to the world. Chat Night Africa broadcast from Washington, uh, D.C. metropolitan area. And I have guests on the show. You can actually dial the number 240-603-7367. 240-603-7367. I'll be bringing back up um, lawyer Fat Mata. Are you with the impression, Fat Matter, that some men just don't know that their actions are tantamount or amount to sexual harassment? Well, I'm sure there are some who, who may not be quite aware, but I think over the last few years, there has been such a, a high level of awareness and conversations and discussions of what it means and what it takes. And I think for some men, it's just hard for them to, to change and switch from what has been accepted or acceptable or accepted or over however long it's been our entire um, life. Like, you know, the, there was a show called Mad Men. So that sort of thing is is what people were used to and so people don't i think to some degree don't want to leave that because it's so uncomfortable for them without taking into into consideration and without acknowledging that their their inability to to accommodate a woman and a woman's right at work and how a woman's right to feel safe at work and comfortable is in itself um, a, a not so good thing, right? It, it, it's one of those things where you as the male or, you know, since most of the time that's how it works, man to woman, and men seem to have a very difficult time and the, the, the instinct is to say, well, I won't even talk to a woman. Well, I won't even hire a woman. Well, I won't even, you know, take a woman with me to a business trip. Why? Why? Can't you keep your hands to yourself? Can't you, you know, can't you respect her and her intelligence and her work ethic? Can't you expect respect her as a person to, to be around her without having to make sexual comments or sexual innuendos or invade her personal space without making her feel uncomfortable or expecting that you should get something more than the best of her as an employee? Why not? And I think that's part of the problem, the expectation as a man that you must be fulfilled in every way and you must have the freedom to say and do whatever you want to do to this individual without consequences. And I think that's part of what the problem is and why it's been so difficult for men to shift. But yeah, there's some men who may be, they say, confused. But as the good doctor said- But, uh, uh, but I, I, I tell you what. There's a sign on the wall, like the good doctor said in her, in her, in her business, if there's a sign on the wall that tells you what it is and you still ignoring it then it's just it's um what what do they call it conscious ignorance i guess fat matter i tell you this you 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 are physically very attractive woman and i i i'm not knowing what you know men are going to be scared to come even try to talk to you <laughs> Well, the, 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 this is, this is how I don't look. know what your reaction is going to be. This is how I look at it. Any man who who would think like that, then you know, probably shouldn't. 
but shouldn't talk to me, I mean, um, because I think the, 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 the definition of a man is someone who is comfortable enough in his own skin, in his own being, in his own self, and in his own truth that he can respectfully res and use respectability in dealing with the opposite sex. If you have an employee, because I'm just a woman, I'm not your employee, and you want to have a conversation with me, you can. I, I owe you nothing. You owe, you hold nothing over me. But if I was your subordinate, you do hold something over my head. And you can make me feel like I must say yes to you because you are my boss. I see. I, I see, Doctor Fielding nodding ahead. Did you want to uh, react to what uh, Fatmata just said, Doctor Fielding? Absolutely. No, I would just want to add that one of the things that comes with power. I mentioned the space in the workspace. One of the things that come with powerful men is the need to take on women. Women's bodies are theirs for the taking, and so it's hard for them to understand no. We understand, especially with powerful bosses, um, saying no to them is a rejection and it goes against the very notion of power. Uh, and so when you hear people saying, oh, women, if the way you speak, men would not uh, approach you, I think it speaks more about the men than it speaks about the women. It speaks about your, about your level of um, what you're thinking about yourself, how you objectify women, how women are not supposed to um, have an opinion um, they're not supposed to have their perspective. They're not supposed to know their rights because according to, from my understanding, a boss who says he, she wants, she wants to go out with a woman, the woman has to say yes, but that's not the case. And that's why I always stress the fact that you have to understand the policies and procedures because every organization has policies and procedures that are shared with employees and sexual harassment is part of it which outlines the do's and don'ts of an office. And it's for you to take time to understand those policies so, to, so as to understand what the boundaries are and how to engage with your colleagues in a respectful manner. Would you like to ask lawyer Fatmata a question? Um, what, 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 I mean, what she, she, she said, what she said is really brilliant. And I do agree in terms of um, what, she, what she, I mean, the point she brought up about uh, boundaries, about um, women's rights, about, about uh, I'm just curious, um, have you ever, what are some of the, the most outrageous case you've heard about concerning uh, sexual, sexual harassment within, in the United States? When that was really outrageous, because we've heard it all, but what has, for you, have, 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 did you think, uh, this is the first time I've heard about this? Ah, uh, I've, I've heard, you know, not personally um, being around, but I have heard of cases from other attorneys um, wherein the, the boss actually physically um, pushed her either against the wall or on the office couch. And it, you know, and even that was hard for her to prove in court. And those are the reasons why some places need to make changes to, to the law and the language in the law. And because right now it's very high. So it has to be what they call severe and pervasive. And the best thing that have happened here in Montgomery County was the change from pervasive, from severe and pervasive to, you know, to a much lower um, standard because that's just very difficult to prove and it's not fair to the victim. And it happens a lot more than people think it does because people excuse it. Well, I didn't mean it like that, but you did. And when you're physically in a person's space and physically pushing them against the wall and kissing them, that's really, really um, egregious. So that's some of what this I've is, heard. Yeah, this is, let's, let's not talk about proof. And I'll take a last word from, um, well, not really last, but if she wants to, if Dr. Fielding wants to react to what um, 
a lawyer, Edwin Fogham, will be talking, coming to talk on uh, family law. That's fine. Um, you have questions to about us, fine. We want this interactive. How do you prove this? Uh, somebody shows up 10 years after, 20 years after, this happened. It has to be tough for you to prove it. Well, what are you asking the, your client as, uh, as, as a lawyer? Well, I haven't, I, I personally have not represented anyone um, who has been sexually harassed. However, How would you expect the woman to prove that? Well, that that is that is the that is the 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 rub, isn't it? That's the crux of it all. And this is why they say, as much as you can, believe the woman, because it's not easy to step forward, because it's not easy to prove, and you are vilified as the woman. So, what woman in her right mind will come forward with something like that when she has no way of proving it? So, there are different ways, right? So, for many women. They, they may have at least told one person. So now they have one person who said, in 1985, when this happened, she told me that Wednesday that this is what happened. Or she wrote something. Or she sent an email to HR, and HR did nothing. Or she told her therapist, and she gave her therapist permission to now say it. Any of that. Or she could come up with the dates and the times exactly where he was, what they were doing, and all that. And so she knows things that she otherwise would not have known unless she had been in that situation that she speaks of. And of course, like I said earlier, most of the time, if they've done it once, they've probably done it two, three, four times. And if she's able to get the other women to come forward, you have a case. You have a case? What kind of case? Civil or criminal lawsuit? Oh, it depends on the um, it depends on the jurisdiction you're in. So it could be both because if you are charged um, criminally, because you know if you actually did the act of sexual assault and things like that, then okay. But if it's se sexual harassment, it's mainly um, civil suit. So you know you can have that brought on, but jurisdiction may have something else in their books. So all, every ju jurisdiction is different. And that's why in America, you, your, your bar license doesn't transfer to every state. Almost every state you have to take an entire new bar exam because all states have different laws and policies when it comes to different um, rule, different- Before uh, lawyer Edwin Fogham comes on the platform to take questions on family law, is there last word or anything you think you should want to say about sexual harassment before you go? Read. <laughs> um, uh, the good doctor said it earlier. Dr. Patricia said it earlier. If you are in, uh, if you are employed in any organization, make sure that you read what they give you because Almost every single one, at least here in the U.S. of A, has all everything that they do not allow, that do not they do not accept. So read and take the time, take the time to listen, because sometimes we are within ourselves and we think what we will accept, somebody else should. What I may be able to accept, you may not. Listen to what somebody's telling you when they say. I am uncomfortable when you put your arm around my shoulder. Don't do it again. It should only take one time. If somebody says, I do not want to have dinner with you, listen to them. They don't want to have dinner with you. If they want to, they will say yes. Don't keep pushing. If you have employees, do not, and I repeat, do not ask them out. I'm sure you've seen movies where they fire somebody and say, okay, I want to, I want to go out with you. Don't do that either. That's just a movie. Don't fire someone just because you want to go out with them. So, you know, those are just little things. There's more things that you can talk about. Fat Mata, you speak so brilliantly on the law. I mean, it's true that you're a lawyer. I went to law school, but I mean, your communication of it is so succinct, clear to the point. If somebody wanted to talk to you off this platform, how do they reach you? So I have a website. My law firm is the Barry Law Center, um, www.barry, B-A-R-R-I-E, lawcenter 
barrylawcenter.com. My email is um, f barry um, at barrylawcenter.com. And you can also call at 240-324-8222. That's all the information for uh, my law firm. And I'm also on Facebook. So the Barry Law Center Facebook page is live. I put updates there all the time on different um, legal policies that are coming up. And I can also be a bridge to that law firm. <laughs> if after all this is said, you missed anything, you can contact Divine at Chapter Africa and we will make that bridge possible. Yes. Now, don't look at, don't, don't, don't look at, uh, um, Lawyer Fatmata and get scared. She's very accessible, very personable. <laughs> this lawyer, <Yes. laughs> I've known her for a while. She's very personable, very accessible. Thank you, Fatmata. Thank you very much for having. It's been a fantastic time. And um, thank you, everyone, for taking the time to listen. And hopefully, um, you learned something, something new. But if you have any questions, please do not hesitate to contact. I'm more than willing to speak. To, um, to anyone who is willing to ask the question. And um, I say thank you. Indeed. And that is um, lawyer Fatmata Barry at Chat Night Africa. We'll be right back after this transition. Africa. Let's gang up, change mindsets, and empower Africans. Are you ready? Africa to the world. Thank you, thank you, thank you for remaining there. We have still uh, some great stuff to discuss and um, uh, before I bring uh, lawyer Fogam on the platform, uh, once more, let's welcome Dr. Pat Fielding. I have one or two questions um, sure. for her. If you found yourself being harassed at work, what's going to be your reaction? Um, are there times, are there times that you doubt the veracity of the claims by some women? Well, I, 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 I hesitate that we, we, that we focus on individual women's stories, but if we could just look at the workplace as a whole and the expectations, because as I mentioned, every workplace has sexual harassment policies. We all know we're going to work to do work. And I know some people go for ulterior motives, but understanding the context, understanding that space is very important. And with with regards to women who who come forward, if I believe them or not, as we mentioned, it all depends on the evidence, and that's for the courts to decide. But what I what I have what what I'm afraid of is that we blame the victim. It's not easy coming forward to see somebody sexually harassed you, and oftentimes when the woman is placed on the uh, on the stand she is being victimized all over again. She has to go through that experience to recount what happened. And sometimes it's not pretty. It's like being victimized all over again. So, and I would also like for us to look at 
what conversations are we having with men? Because again, oftentimes we have, it's the men who are committing the acts of violence. What are these conversations? What do they understand in terms of women's rights? What do they understand in terms of relationships? And how are those relations, how are those understandings skewed? Because it takes two, I'm afraid, and for us to really move forward in creating safe spaces for everybody, it's good for us to understand what those boundaries are and what, do, what, what our expectations of each other are. Are there times women could harass men too, maybe. I mean, some men have said that the way women dress and come into their offices is so provocative. Do those well, men have what, a reason? What do, you, what do you mean by provocative? Because provocative is, is that's, uh, that's subjective. What do you mean by provocative? Dressing, explicit dress. I mean, dressing in a way that kind of um, um, explicitly you know, uh, projects some areas of their bodies. And I mean, again, this, this, this is what I hear from some men. I'm Again, you, from I, I'm going to go back to based on my understanding of policy and process, every office has dress code. I know for all the offices I've worked in, they have dress code, what is possible and what is not. So I'm not sure I understand because it goes back to the victim blaming, blaming women for making me do this act, blaming women for wanting to go out with them. Again, what is this space we're operating in? It's a workspace. What are we supposed to be doing in this space? Working. If we're going to have relationships, it should be, it should be consensual. It shouldn't be because somebody dressed provocatively and that led me to sin. It just reminds me of what this guy who just shot eight women did. I'm going to kill eight women because they made me think about um, I have a, I'm a sexual addict. So I'm going to kill people. It's always good for us to take responsibility, both the men and the women, looking at how the spaces in which we're operating and what the expectations are. And if some, so, so for, for the question about women being provocative, I really can answer to that because that's a subjective question. I will bring you to uh, react to what um, uh, lawyer Edwin will be saying on uh, family law. I am definitely sure that you may have some thoughts about what he's going to uh, say. Ladies and gentlemen, join me now in welcoming lawyer Edwin Fogham. We are about to start family law. Hello, everyone. As they say in court, I'd like to welcome the learned gentleman. Thank you, Divan. Thank you for having me. Edwin, bad things happen to good people. When people get married, marriage is supposed to be a covenant. Unfortunately, it doesn't always end that way. Uh, before long, people at, are at each other's throats, at daggers drawn. Then they start talking about the divorce. Tell me a little bit, Edwin, when somebody comes into your office and tells you that they want you to represent them in a divorce case, what are the questions you are first asking? Yeah, thank you. That is a very important question. But before I answer that question, let me touch a little bit on your prior discussions. A couple of things came up. First of all, I want to underscore the fact that, um, just as lawyer Barry said, that uh, a disclaimer, whatever we're saying here is not, is for educational and informational purposes only. It shouldn't be construed as legal advice and does not establish any attorney-client relationship. So that's on the side. Um, you asked uh, lawyer Barry and uh, patients a question about the cultural ramifications or the cultural aspects of sexual harassment. Now, I, I would like to put that in perspective a little bit. Uh, you are right to state that the laws of a society are formulated or are based on the culture or the values of that society. However, there are certain fundamental rights, fundamental wrongs. That's why there are laws of international human rights, right? Although the society has not, may not have established or formulated certain practices into their laws, that doesn't make those practices right. I'll give you an example. I've done lots of cases involving uh, female genital mutilation. In Africa, many countries, Senegal, Gambia, Guinea, and so on, sexual I mean, uh, female genital mutilation is part of the culture. 
for a long time, it never became, there was, there were no laws uh, against those type of practices. However, those were violations of international norms. Recently, laws have been formulated to, to take care of those things. That's an example. So sexual harassment should be put in the same perspective. The fact that you do something back there, you get married to, I mean, kids getting married to kids, do things to children. The fact that the culture and practice of that place uh, entertains that doesn't make that right. It's fundamentally wrong. Now, again, it can be interpreted in many ways, but that is the essence of it. I also want to touch on the awareness factor. I believe it was, uh, I think, I don't know whether it was patience or what that. You asked the question about if a man is not aware and does certain things at the workplace, whether that is sexual harassment or not, if they would. Now, you already, you started this program by saying ignorance of the law is not an excuse, but I don't even want to put it in the legal perspective. I want to put it in a human perspective, in the sense that, yes, human beings, a reasonable person is not bound to be a paragon of prudence, right? But when it comes to something that the society has on a borderline, it's on a borderline, and there is so much information about you, it is incumbent upon you to educate and inform yourself. In fact, I would suggest that it is incumbent upon you to be a paragon of prudence as far as that particular aspect is concerned. So I don't think, and again, I think it's uh, patients who mentioned that sometimes you see it on the wall. It's been written to you. Probably when you were being hired, you received an employee handbook. Everything was written. So it is exactly what lawyer Barry said. It is. Actually, she said, will, she is a willful ignorance, but it is willful ignorance. So that is another thing about that. Now, regarding the question you just asked uh, patients about somebody, a woman dressing provocatively and coming to your office and so on. Again, forget about the subjective aspect of that. She's right. It is subjective, but even forget about that. The fact that somebody decides to dress provocatively, doesn't give you the right to, uh, to see that as such. Even if somebody walks in front of you naked in a legal situation where nakedness is allowed, why should you con why should you think that you have a right to do whatever you want with that person's body? You mentioned you, in your questions about this program, you said, can a man rape his wife? I don't know whether you're going to deal with that question, but that is an insinuation, right? Um, so those are some of the things I wanted to touch on regarding sexual harassment before I answer my question. But even then, there is still one more. I want to touch on the burden of proof. Yes. You said something about the burden of proof. And lawyer Barry answered it properly by explaining to you that yes, it has to be proven in court, but if there are so many, there is something called circumstantial evidence. Now, if there is overwhelming evidence that a certain practice has been engaged in, definitely that's going to convince the jury, okay? If you have 10, 15, 20 people coming out to say the same thing, that is circumstantial, but it is very probative and will probably corroborate other aspects of the case. So yes, that can prove the case. Now, going back to your question. When Somebody comes to your office. Bad things happen to good people. And a lot of the times, right. they come and ask you, lawyer Edwin Fogham, they would like you represent them. What questions are you asking them? OK, first of all, are we talking of divorce? Are they married? Or it is a relationship? not based on marriage because there are familiar relationships that are not legal marriage relationship and they may have children out of that relationship and those things will require legal uh, involvement. However, let's assume that this is a married person and let's also assume that a child or children are involved and let's again assume that, let's make it very complex, right? A complex scenario. There are property issues involved. And we assume also that that person is also seeking something like alimony to be paid in, as a result of this divorce. So you, you have to analyze these things 
one by one, you tell you, first of all, you find out from the person whether they have a ground for divorce. There are various grounds for divorce, right? Have they been separated? In Maryland, for example, separation is a ground for divorce, one year separation or two years separation, one year with the intention to end the marriage, two years without the intention is a ground for divorce. There are other, there are other fault grounds like adultery, vicious conducts or if somebody goes to jail so the first thing you do is to determine whether there is there is a ground for divorce now but before i even do that i first of all find let the client understand they will tell you they will tell you the history of the, their relationship and the problems and everything but you have to first of all make the client understand that the, the history of the relationship is important but it is peripherally important in the legal context because ultimately when you get to the point where it is a breakup of the relationship then it really doesn't matter who loved who or who didn't love who whose, whose mother came to the house and did not do this or whose father said this about this or who did not buy who something and those things are the development and the romantic aspects of the relationship and it is important for the client to understand going forward or before anybody else you take any case going forward to understand that yes bad things could have happened but many of those things may not be legally relevant some judges will tell you some circuit court judges will tell you up front, in front of that, i don't care what happened between you i don't know why you guys are here but you're in front of me and i'm only here to determine whether you're going to be divorced and whether uh, how your children are going to be provided for and what you are going to do with the property, okay? So that's number one. Number two, if there are children involved, if they have children, you have to consider, you have to find out whether she would like to be the custodial parent or, or he would like to be the custodial parent or he would just like visitation, okay? Now, that is important because Money follows the physical custodial pet. The fiscal. I was going to ask you that because yes, that when it comes very, to custody, it can be very contentious. I've seen a lot of it. Yes, so that is very important because, and again, yeah, a fit and proper parent. But one important thing you must tell every client is it is not about them at that point. It is the magic phrase: the best interest of the child. So the court will look at those things. So you have to first determine from your client's perspective whether it is in the best interest of the child for your client to have full physical custody. Of course, you cancel them based on that and you find out more about the other party. Now, moving from physical custody, you have to find out whether they have property, marital property, joint property. Now, Maryland, sometimes Maryland is jokingly called married land because not only it is difficult to divorce because of the time you separation uh marital property is any property that the parties have together that that was acquired after marriage it doesn't matter who got them it is divided 50 50 the, yes 50 50 so that's an important thing to discuss with your clients then of course moving from there you now discuss the possibility of litigation going to going through to the end and i always tell clients that Ultimately, in a contentious, lengthy, costly divorce proceedings with various issues like child support, uh, custody, property, nobody really wins. Nobody. We, we will come so, to that. I'm going to ask you, yes, lawyer, okay. uh, lawyer Fogham, how does it happen that divorce cases tend to be lengthy, contentious, costly? What's going on? You lawyers must be very happy when it's lengthy. That's where I was. That's what I was going to say. Uh, not that lawyers are happy, but I think it is incumbent on lawyer to, at the onset of representation, to explain to the client the options and the possibilities. For example, a well-drafted marital separation agreement, right, between the parties before divorce can save the parties a lot of time money cost emotional emotional uh pain and things like that yes 
So uh, lawyers would like to go to litigation because it's, I mean, you pay the lawyers and everything. However, I think it, you will feel happier if that ca your case is resolved with your client understanding every aspect of the case and you make enough money, but you get a real amicable and helpful marital separation agreement. What happens when you draft that with your client and have the other party review them with a lawyer, what happens is the court accepts that and either merge that or incorporates that into the divorce. And the hearing is short. The parties have agreed to the various issues, child support, custody, marital property, and so on. So that is what can avoid lengthy, contentious, and bitter divorce. Unfortunately, some divorce cases are based on just vindictiveness, vengeance, and some parties are ready to fight and are willing to spend money just to fight. There's not much you can do about that. Now, Maryland is one of the states that encourages what is called a collaborative divorce. Collaborative divorce simply means that the parties try to get their own counsels and do everything, resolve the issues without litigation. So. That is what people may want to consider. Uh, but if, if it comes to it and you have to litigate the case and you have to go through, through the trial, then it has to be that way. You are watching You and the Law, Voices of Africa, Chatnet Africa. On the platform now is lawyer Edwin Fogham. You said in a divorce suit, nobody really wins. I would think people, I mean, if, if you are fighting over child custody and it's granted to you, you've won. If you okay. wanted the house and you get the house, you've won. If you wanted Ali money, and I'm going to ask you a question about Ali money, mm -hmm. and it's paid to you, you've won. Why do you think nobody wins in this? Okay, yeah, that's a good way. That's a, I mean, you're right thinking that way. From the legal perspective, Yes, an order will be entered and one person will be granted whatever they're requesting against the other party. But look at it this way. Forget about the expenditure and the cost and the emotional trauma. Look at when it ends. See, in Maryland and other states, the custody battle or a custody battle or custody battles do not end until or unless the child is above the age of 18 and 19, which means at any time after you've quote unquote won, the other party can file a motion or a petition for modification. Now- To modify what? To modify the court order. The court may enter an order giving you custody of the child. Now, six months after that, one year after that, the other party can garner uh whatever they're gathering prepare for that and come up with a petition to modify based on change circumstances because the way the order is entered under the law if there is or there are substantial changes in circumstances the court is bound to review the order right for example loss of employment illness uh serious accidents and other maybe things somebody that, became an alcoholic exactly abuse and other things that are not in the best interest of the child now that is for custody battles and again in maryland for example even after 18 if the child is still in high school child support continues and modification can still take place unless the party had entered into an agreement which was incorporated in the divorce so stating that they will take care of the child in college some agreements are done that way where the parties are well to do and they agree that until the child finishes college, both parties will be engaged in the child's life. In that case, the court order will prevail over the 18 years uh, bar. So you see why I say nobody wins because it's a continuous battle. You talked about alimony. Uh, what is it? I, the vic information i have about it is knowledge is this involves money being paid by one party to another who pays the money to who and what determines that well it is very interesting alimony because uh alimony is paid 
to either party for either it is either rehabilitative alimony or permanent alimony now rehabilitative alimony simply means that one party is in a situation at the end of the marriage after the divorce one of the parties in a situation that is not uh is somehow unfair because during the relationship they either spent their time taking care of the family uh the children while the other party was going on growing and developing and things like that for example a man may may stay home and be taking care of the, the kids while the woman goes to work for many years and things like that now in that case if for some reason the parties are divorced the court may enter an order to the effect that some money should be paid by the woman to the man after the divorce to rehabilitate for him to rehabilitate himself to go back to school or do of to do something that will improve his state because he has spent time during the relationship taking care of the family and vice versa even a woman now there are lots of factors that will come in of course the incomes of the party will come into play they will look at incomes of the party the standard of living that the parties had uh, look at the uh, the possibility of getting a job. Maybe while that man was staying home, he was actually educated and got, he himself is educated already and he could get a job. Alimony would not be considered. So there are lots of factors that come in, but permanent alimony is rare because permanent alimony means that you'll be paid for life or until the person dies. Lawyer Edwin, rare. are there times it's that you have amicable divorce. Yes. What drives that? Amicable divorce. First what of drives all, that? Uh, first of all, most uncontested divorce, when if you don't have children, for example, and you have a ground for divorce, you don't even have a choice. It's going to be amicable <laughs> because, first of all, the party files it. What are you going to contest? If you have been separated for one year or two years, uh, uh, or let's say two years in Maryland, and the other party files for divorce, you have no choice. It has to be amicable. It's uncontested. That's one. But let's even look at a situation where a divorce is, is, is actually bitter. The parties can still, during the process of filing for divorce and going to court, still come together, like I mentioned before, come up with a marital separation agreement, right? Which, which will capture the issues, the contentious issues. And in that case, the lawyers can work with the clients to, to come up with this agreement and capture all the issues and they agree on it. And that will end up being an amicable divorce because by the time they will be going to before a judge for an order of divorce, they would have, they would have agreed on the, on the issues. And what the judge would just would do is either incorporate the agreement into the divorce or merge it into the divorce and that would be an amicable divorce because the, the 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 issues the contentious issues would have been resolved by the parties we were talking in the green room and you said when you talk about relationships and problems you're not only talking about those who signed marriage certificates in court would you please explain that what well, come again when you talk about relationships and problems leading to divorce, you're not only talking about those who actually have marriage certificates, in other words, legally married, like in all okay. some states. Are they, okay. Would you please explain I that think, before we go? Yeah, because I think you mentioned something about couples who have who been living. In some states, I believe this is one, this is one uh, jurisdiction that have what you call common law marriage, where parties who have been, who have been living together and holding themselves out as husband, husband and wife, or wife and husband, are considered to be married, even though the, no document has been signed. It's called common law marriage. Uh, Maryland doesn't recognize common law marriage. So in Maryland, as I told you before, Maryland is considered married land. <laughs> so in Maryland, you have to be legally married for it to be considered. Also, there are other familiar relationships, right? Uh, parties can come together, boyfriend and girlfriend, and they may not be married, but they may acquire prop property. 
for example, they may buy a house or something like that. In that case, it will not be marital property. However, it will still be owned in common. It will be like both parties will have a contractual right to half of to half of the property if they bought it together and so on. So those are the type of familiar relationship that may not be legally it may not be a marriage, but that can engender various uh, legal issues. I told you from the start that by the time the broadcast ends, you would think and talk like a lawyer. What would you like people remember about your appearance at Chat Night Africa today? What should people take home? I think the most important thing to take home, as I said from the beginning, is that just get yourself, just be informed, just be informed and instructed a little bit about the ramifications of uh, familiar relationships. Uh, it is a, most familiar relationships are sacred, based on trust, uh, care, and love. However, however, they are legal underpinnings and ramifications. So it's important to keep that in perspective. Okay, once you keep that in perspective, you should be fine. Um, yeah, and more also, not every, not every uh, clash should end in a deadly way. Right? Sometimes two wrongs are wrong, a right and a wrong are wrong, but sometimes and many times some of the greatest tragedies have occurred when two rights collide. See, two people have different values, they are both right, but unfortunately they are seeing things differently and sometimes that's what happens. So an open mind is required in many Edwin, this is a text I just got. The writer says, Mr. Lawyer, it's not fair, even though he agrees with it, that ignorance of the law is no excuse. In saying this, did you people expect everybody to go to law school? Okay. Why, should, why shouldn't it be excusable that you are ignorant because, of the let, law? Let me, let me tell you, fundamentally, the only reason why ignorance of the law is not an excuse is because if that was an excuse, everybody would plead it. Okay? That is the main reason why ignorance of the law is not an excuse. That is not to say everybody knows the law or should know the law. I think it is a balancing of societal needs that brought that particular legal uh, norm. Because if it was that anybody can say, I didn't know, and everybody no, will say, I, I didn't know. I didn't know. Because <laughs> as, as, as one English judge said, even the devil himself cannot judge the, the thoughts of a man. What's <laughs> so, your last word, Edwin? We could, we could talk you. to you tomorrow morning. What's yeah, your last word? I've been going for a long time. I, yeah, I'm, I'm, I just, I'm thankful for the opportunity to be able to provide what sim simple or, or what simple information I have. And, I'll be glad to take any questions if people have them. Now, if contact somebody me. wanted to contact you, what are you specialized in? What, what kinds of cases do you accept? Uh, I have three areas. Of and would you turn down a case which you feel that is bad? Can just, yes, can just definitely, do anything about Definitely. That should be one of the first things a lawyer should do. A case that you feel not bad in the sense that it's a difficult case, but bad in the sense that it is not a valid case to pursue. And there are other legal things you consider to make that determination. But to answer your first question, the areas of uh, law I practice is uh, uh, immigration, uh, personal injury, and family law. Now, I do a lot of collaborative practice that is getting doing areas in international business transactions and other business work, corporate work, with some experts and other corporations. And those are the main areas that are- And how can you be contacted? Uh, I have a website. My website is uh, www.forgamlaw.com. You can also email me 
ekfogam at fogamlaw.com. You can call my offices in Silver Spring, Maryland, 8121 Georgia Avenue, Suite 715. You can call my office on 301 608 1555. You can even call my cell phone. Hey. Or you can contact Chad Night yeah, Africa. <laughs> I'll, talk, I'll talk to you and then, or you can contact Chad Night Africa. That's correct. Thank you. <laughs> You, Edwin, thank you so much for coming to Chat Night Africa. You you discuss law in such a way that, I mean, makes it, it just so sweet. You one could sit here listening to you all night, all day. One would like to even go to law school from the way you talk these things. You and Fat Fat Matabari have been phenomenal. I want to express my appreciations to you, sir. Oh, thank you, Nidivan. That's so kind of you. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, we've come to the end of this broadcast, Chat Night Africa. We uh, bring people to empower you, to weaponize you, because knowledge is power. Unfortunately, you cannot find yourself on the wrong side of the law, and before a judge in court, you say, I didn't know. Sorry, ignorance of the law is no excuse. While you are not required to go to law school, we make it possible for you to get some essential ideas which would make you function in a sane way and not step on people's toes to turn around and find yourself in legal jeopardy. Thank you for watching. That's how we round up this edition of Chat Night Africa. My name is uh, Divine Chamakong. Goodbye. I'm coming back. I'm coming back. I'm coming. Coming to get down. I'm coming. I'm coming. Dance, do dance. We're gonna dance, we're gonna dance. We're gonna get down, we're gonna get down. We're gonna party, party hard. We're gonna boogie, boogie, woogie. And when we jam, it's out of sight. This song right here, it's dynamite. I'm ready.